We're live. Hello, everybody. It's Monday, and Julie is back. So it's hey it's the Tom and Julia show. Let me turn you up here, Julia. Make sure that they can hear your voice. All right, you're up to the max now. So it's Monday. It's Monday with Tom and Julia. We're going to tie some flies. Everybody want to tie some flies? Um, anybody tie over the weekend? Anybody go fishing over the weekend? There's Ed from Florida. Ed's in the house. Who else is in here today? What do we got? We got an international audience? We should for the pheasant tail. We should have an international audience because this is an international fly. And so it's pretty gloomy here in Vermont. It's what we call, oh, Corey Brago, trout spade it, my neighbor. Nice going, Corey. Did you get anything, Corey? Sweden is in the house. Arvid from Sweden and the Gulf Coast. Mark from the Gulf Coast. And Sarah's here, and Brandon, and the UK, Kieran from the UK, and from New Zealand, and from California. Wow. Wow, we got an international audience, and Indiana. Bill fished the PM in Michigan, and got three steelhead, only one landed. Well, that one for three is, is pretty typical. That's, that's a pretty cool day of steelhead fishing. And we got New Zealand, we got Scotland. Wow, we do have an international audience today. Well, welcome everybody. Um, we'll wait a couple minutes um, before people get in so I don't have to answer the same questions twice. <laughs> although, although I don't mind doing it because I do it all the time on the podcast. <laughs> um, Hope you've all been enjoying the Learning Center. We're almost done this week uh, on the Learning Center. We're pre premiering some really advanced stillwater techniques uh, with Phil Rowley. I am not a good still stillwater angler. And so for this uh, Learning Center chapter, um, I um, filmed it with Phil Rowley, who is, is kind of my go-to guy. He's one of the most knowledgeable stillwater anglers in North America. And um, there are some really different techniques in there that you have probably never seen before unless you're a serious stillwater angler. So um, that's up on the Learning Center. I don't know if it's up yet, but it, um, it will be up probably within the next few hours. And um, Phil goes through um, nymphing techniques, stillwater nymphing techniques, and there's some, some pretty cool stuff in there and some pretty interesting rigging. So um, I hope you enjoy that. Um, Ralph wants to know how it's going. Well, it's going pretty well, Ralph. I'm sitting here at my, at my tying bench and talking to you guys and talking to Julia. So, so life is good. I, uh, went fishing last week, caught some landlocked Atlantic salmon, some big ones. And so, uh, I'm feeling pretty good. Trout fishing is really slowing down. And, uh, so we're gonna we're gonna tie we're gonna tie a classic pheasant tail nymph today, and you may be familiar with what most um, fly shops and tires call the pheasant tail, which um, which I call the American pheasant tail. Um, it it was a pattern developed by the late Al Troth in in Montana, and it's it's sort of based on Frank Sawyer's original pheasant tail, but it, it, it looks much, much different. We shouldn't even be calling it a pheasant tail nymph, or we should be calling it an American pheasant tail, certainly, not just pheasant tail nymph, because it is much different. The um, American pheasant tail has a much wider, broader profile than um, the original pheasant tail, and it's meant to imitate uh, more of the freestone type um, mayfly and stonefly nymphs that we have. It, it's quite broad. It's quite wide. Um, it has legs and it has a fairly hefty peacock hurl thorax. It's actually, the American pheasant tail is, is more like a copper john tied with pheasant tail. 
And um, the pheasant tail we're going to tie today is one that you should also have in your box and treat it as a separate pattern. It is, it is nothing like, really nothing like the American pheasant tail other than it uses similar materials. It also uses fewer materials. Um, but the, um, the classic pheasant tail was developed by a gentleman named Frank Sawyer who was river keeper on the River Avon in the UK. Um, that's a chalk stream, what we would call a spring creek. And, and this gentleman spent um, all of his time on the river. Um, not only was he fishing, but he was, he was watching the trout, protecting the trout, uh, helping anglers, cutting weeds. He was just on the river every day, all day long. And thus had a lot of time to uh, observe trout and their reactions to flies. And um, some of the things, some of the things that, that Sawyer noticed were that um, when you're fishing a nymph, particularly during the summertime when there weren't a lot of hatches, um, but the fish were still eating nymphs and they were mostly eating little swimming nymphs like um, you know, beta species and pseudocleons and some of the other Latin names of the little, little swimming nymphs that that live in aquatic vegetation. Um, notice that the, the flies were very slim. He no, noted that you needed to get your fly into the water quickly, you needed to enter the water and, and get into the water quickly. And that uh, legs were not really visible on these flies. He, he did, some, did some measurements and he noticed that the legs on the emerged done or the adult mayfly, the subadult mayfly, were three times as big as long as the legs on the nymph. The legs on the um, a lot of these nymphs are really, really insignificant. And he also saw that when he tied legs into his nymphs, they would retard the sink rate because they were outriggers and they would slow that nymph down. It's the same principle, really that is used today on uh, flies like the Pertagon, where you've heard the term uh, slim for the win. Um, the slimmer the fly, uh, the quicker it will sink because it has less resistance to the water. And this is not a new concept. Sawyer figured this out in the 1940s and the 1950s. And um, although he was almost entirely or probably entirely sight fishing to visible fish, in relatively shallow water, the River Avon is not a very, not a very big stream, and um, the water is is slow and smooth. So he didn't have any trouble getting his nymphs down. I'll, and I'll, so, although he was mostly sight fishing with these nymphs, um, the classic pheasant tail nymph is also a great fly for Euro techniques. Um, for fishing under an indicator or under a dry dropper. Um, it, it's tied, it, it doesn't have as much weight. Um, you, you can tie this with a bead. We're not going to tie it with a bead. We're going to tie it um, a more traditional way because a number of reasons. One is that sometimes you want a nymph that doesn't sink as quickly as a beaded nymph. And the other thing is that um, in pressured waters, fish get used to beads and they start to shy away from shiny brass beads. Um, and sometimes, you know, they get caught and release a number of times on these beaded flies. And sometimes a non-beaded fly is a little bit more subtle and a little bit more eagerly accepted by the fish. So, um, you know, you do need, you don't just want big bulky nymphs as, you know, as the, the Pertagons um, have proven there's sometimes when you want a skinny little nymph uh, that sinks quickly. And this is one that, although is it an, it's an older pattern, there are not many um, nymphs, particularly when you're imitating smaller mayflies, that are better than the classic pheasant tail. So um, it's, just a, it's just a terrific fly. I wouldn't go anywhere without pheasant tails in my box. I use them I use them on small streams under a, a dry fly with a dry dropper. I use them on um, big tailwaters, big western tailwaters. I use them in the Catskills. I, I've used them nearly everywhere I've gone fishing, um, and, and they always work. So um, 
If you have a bunch of beads in your box, beaded flies, make sure you have some of these. It's good to have a choice and it's good to give the fish a choice. So maybe try fishing a, um, a beaded nymph with, and then hang a, um, hang a uh, unbeaded pheasant tail on the back end of it on a, on a dropper or either tied to the bend or tied to the leader as a dropper. Uh, try that out because I think I think you'd be surprised at the number of fish that take that non-beaded fly as opposed to the beaded fly. All right, do we have any questions? Roger Bird has a poor connection in the SAC room. I forgot what the SAC room is, but it's like um, Roger told me it's like it's like a detention room. So Roger's Roger's in there with the bad kids trying to listen <laughs> trying to listen to fly dying. <laughs> um okay i put the i put the recipe in the comments yep. um, but tim was asking if you're going to be using thread or fine copper wire so i know you're going to be using wire for one of them yeah i'm going to do it both ways today you know right. I, i'm going to tie i'm going to tie the fly now in in uh, frank sawyer's book um which which is a terrific book by the way unfortunately it's out of print and um, you can find used copies, but they're quite expensive. Um, but Frank Sawyer's grandson um, wrote another book and included a lot of Sawyer's correspondence. And I forgot the name of it, but if you look it up, if you look up, you know, Frank Sawyer um, in um, in used books or in new books, you'll you'll find that book. This is the original uh, book that was was written by Frank Sawyer, and and I, I'm lucky enough to have a copy, but. Um, if you if you find a copy in a used bookstore and it's not terribly expensive, buy it. I looked today and and they were like I think six sixty seventy dollars for a used um, hardcover. So not not cheap and it it hasn't been brought back into print yet. Um, but it is a terrific book. As I said, Sawyer spent spent all his life on a river and and the information there not only about about flies but about fishing is is still valid today as valid as anything being written today, even though he didn't have graphite rods and he didn't have really strong, fine tippet material. And he didn't have all of the tying materials we have available to us today, but um, it, it's a great book. Um, so I'm gonna tie I'm gonna tie it both ways. I'm gonna tie it with wire like Sawyer did. And then I'm gonna tie it with thread um, as a more conventionally tied uh, today. But it's really easy to tie with wire. It's very quick, it's very easy. Um, you don't get quite as much weight as you would by adding some um, non-lead non wire under the thorax, but it but does, it does add some weight when you tie it with copper wire. So, okay, we got a question from Sean. He's asking, um, would you use this in swift water uh, if or below ripples, and is it supposed to be a clinger? You know, it's supposed to be a mayfly nymph, <laughs> and and it has a general shape of a mayfly, of a mayfly nymph, particularly small mayfly nymphs. And I don't know if it imitates a swimmer, or a clinger, or whatever when we fish it. Um, it just it's just got the shape and the translucency and the movements of those little pheasant tail fibers that look like the gills along the body. And I would use it anywhere. This was developed for slower, smoother water chalk stream, but it works really well in riffles as well. It may not work as well in riffles as a broader profile nymph, just because the fish uh, may not notice this fly. But if they're they're really picky and they're in a riffle, they'll see it and they'll take it. So I mean, I would fish it anywhere. Anywhere you're going to fish a nymph, I would try this fly. Um, it it there are these these smaller swimming nymphs and slimmer nymphs in all kinds of waters. The, the betis mayfly is the most common genus of mayflies in the world, throughout the world, no matter whether you go to Argentina or New Zealand or Slovenia or the UK or Kenya to fish for trout, you're gonna find um, some of these little swimming betis nymphs. So um, it, it just works everywhere. They're everywhere from small streams to giant rivers. So going to work. It's going to work nearly anywhere you put it on your line. The only time it won't work is if you don't tie it onto your tippet. <laughs> um, Roger Bird's asking, do you apply the cement to your thread before you let finish to get a better penetration? No. 
because it gunks up it gunks up my whip finisher if I put the cement on before. Um, you know, I use deep penetrating head cement, and um, and that soaks right down in the thread. So I I don't. It gets messy if you put it on before Roger. You can try it. You can try it, but um, just don't use super glue because then you will glue your whip finisher to your fly. And on the um, on the ones with, um, with that I tie with copper wire, I don't even I don't even use head cement um, because um, I don't I don't know if it, it helps much. The copper holds that pheasant tail pretty well, and um, they're so quick to tie that. If it falls apart, you just throw it away and use another one. Or you bring the hook back and you take the wire I'm off. And... What size is that? Oh, yeah, good. Yeah, I see John says I carry them in 14 through 20. And those are the sizes um, that I use, John. Um, yeah, 14 through 20. Um, it's, it's hard to find pheasant tail to tie bigger than a 14. You have to, you have to find a really good, uh, really good pheasant tail really long one to tie a tie a 12 um but um you know if you tie if you tie in more fibers you can generally uh use up that shank and, and tie a 12 but 14 14 through 20 and mostly 16s and 18s those are the ones that um that i really never want to leave home without the 16s and 18s what head cement do you use i have had bad luck with wraps drying white. Um, I use a uh, deep penetrating head some Orvis deep penetrating head cement. And sometimes that is, is a little, is a little white, uh, leaves a little white. Not that it matters on small nymphs and dry flies. Um, if I want a glossy head, I'll use the, um, high gloss head cement, which dries, uh, clear look, you know, it dries clear, like, like epoxy or whatever. We're going to be doing a, we're going to be doing a, uh, Facebook Live or a video on head cements anyways. Um, I'm working on doing some research on head cements and we'll be doing it. We're, we had a suggestion a couple weeks ago about doing uh, kind of basic materials um, Facebook Lives and we're gonna start some of those. So um, right now we're, we're with patterns, but um, we're, gonna, we're gonna go to some more basic stuff. Ed's gonna tie a 16 and 18. <coughs> Good, Ed. Excuse me. That's uh, those are those are the sizes you want. All right. Shall we go to the tying bench? What do you guys think? Shall we? Is everybody ready to tie? This is an easy one, so you can probably uh, you can probably tie along with me. All right. I'm going to switch the cameras. I'm going to go over to my materials. Oh, I got to show you a pheasant tail first. There's a there's a pheasant tail. Um, that's one that's tied. That's one that's tied uh, conventionally with thread. And those tails are a little long, but um, if I was gonna tie that again, I'd make those tails a little shorter. And then I'll show you one tied with, with copper wire. So there's one that is just tied with copper wire. So there's only two materials on that fly. Um, copper wire as the tying thread and pheasant tail. And then I should, I should um, also mention that Frank Sawyer also had another fly called the gray goose. And it's tied exactly the same way as the pheasant tail. This is a gray goose, except that you use um, gray goose fibers for the, for the, the for everything and uh, gold wire. And I will show you, um, it's, it's tied from a gray goose, just a plain old Canada goose or, or a brand, um, greater, lesser Canada goose, but it's the secondaries, uh, the more rounded quills on the wing. And you can see that I'm, I don't have much left, but you want to use these kind of grayish, olivey, tannish fibers. Um, and the gray goose is a, um, if you look at that fly, uh, it's a great imitation of, of a PMD uh, or a sulfur, pale morning done, pale evening done, sulfur, whatever. Um, it, it's a killer fly as well. And I can never understand why it didn't become as popular 
as the um, as Sawyer's pheasant tail because it's really a it's really a terrific terrific fly. So you know if you if you're a goose hunter, you know a goose hunter. Um, uh, have them save you some wings. Um, I need I need some new goose wings. I have to I have to either shoot a goose or talk to some friends about saving me some goose wings because I, I could only find one in my fly all the fly tying materials I have. All right, so yes. Um, she's asking, do you bother fermenting the wire tie flies? Do I bother fermenting? Anything. Cementing? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. But do you ferment them? I, I ferment everything. No, that's the thing. That's very interesting. And one of the things that Sawyer that Sawyer determined just through observation because he admitted that he didn't he didn't know how fish saw color and he observed that um flies with an orangish tinge during a betas hatch worked better and um yeah this fly you know this fly has an orangish an orangish tinge to it and he just i i nobody knows why but flies with a little orange on them um seem to work really well during a um, betas hatch, and this pheasant tail is a good example of that. So you could tie them. You could tie them with olive dyed pheasant tail, but I have I have honestly found I've tried dyed pheasant tail, and I I I don't. Th I, this isn't scientific, but it doesn't seem to work as well overall as the regular old um, center center pheasant tail, undyed center pheasant tail. You can see I'm running low on good pheasant tail too. So for this fly, the first thing you want to do is to try to get some good pheasant tail. And good pheasant tail is, is one that has the orangey fibers on both sides. It's a center tail, so it's sym symmetrical. And those have the longest fibers. And you're going to find that you're going to run out run out of room, run out of material if you don't use longer fibers. So you do need to find some good, some good pheasant tail. If you, if you go to a fly shop and you, um, and you are picking it out, look for the longest, um, the biggest, longest pheasant tails you can find. Or if you know some pheasant hunters, make sure that they save you those, those center tails. And then um, the copper wire I'm using um, I put it right in a bobbin, but the cool thing about this fly is since, um, copper wire doesn't unwind like thread, you can, you can tie this fly without a bobbin. You can just take a length of copper wire about a, uh, start with about a maybe two to three foot length of copper wire. And, um, you can, you can tie it without a bobbin very easily. Um, the best stuff that I have found is um, is the it would be the extra small size wire. Um, and I measured the stuff I'm using with my chronometer, and it's it's 0.13 millimeters or 0 0.005 inches in diameter. So it's the diameter of a of a six x tippet. Uh, so let's tie one with copper. Let's tie one with copper wire. I'm going to get my hook. I'm just going to get a random small nymph hook out of here because <laughs> they're all mixed up. I've been meaning to, I've been meaning to organize my, my nymph hooks, but they're in terrible shape. All right. So I'm going to put in a, uh, you could use a one X, one X long or a two X long nymph hook. Uh, Sawyer liked a down eye hook and he liked to, uh, there are no pictures of tying the pheasant tail in his, um, in his book, unfortunately, but there were, um, there were, there were, uh, text instructions 
on how to tie it. I'm going to move the camera a little closer here so you can see all the action. Um, so we used a standard, and it looks like it was about a 1x long, but 1x or 2x long works fine. And then to start this thing, I just start my copper wire at the end, and I wind it around. Just break off the end. And then when you get up, not quite to the eye, then you want to just build up a thorax with your wire. So this is where you get the shape of that fly, and you also get added weight. Now, this isn't going to give you as much much weight as a bead or something, but it does give you, you know, some additional weight. You still there, Julia? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, I had another call coming in. I, I wasn't sure. Uh, so that's how you start it. And then you get Sawyer used, Sawyer used four fibers of pheasant tail. And I find he might have had better pheasant tails than me. Um, I find I need to get, I need to use about a half dozen. And if you plan things right and you, and you use ones with, with black at the bottom, you'll get the dark wing case just in the right spot. So I'm going to grab... I'm going to grab about a you know, half dozen of these. If you have a really good, heavy pheasant tail, you could probably use four, but I just haven't been able to. The pheasant tail, and then you want to cut your pheasant tail off right at the base because you're going to need all that length. And then... You're done with selecting materials. So you want the tails. I like the tails really short. So I'm just going to make them really short. I'm going to wind to the back. And with about three turns of wire, with a lot of pressure on there, I'm going to tie in those tails. Those are even too long. I'm gonna tweak them, tweak them a little bit. Yeah, I might have to unwind once. I'm just pulling those tails forward a little bit. Whoops, screwed up. All right, let's try that again. Now I got them all bunged up. That's okay. Then they'll split for me. Let's see. Yeah. Good enough. Well, that looks terrible. Yeah. See if I can re realign these tails. I kind of tweaked them. I'm just rolling these tails in my in my hand here. You can't see it. It looks it looks sloppy. It doesn't matter to the fish. It matters to me. All right. So now I got my tails in there. I might take one extra turn just for security and then what you do is you just pull your tails down gently and you just twist them around the wire kind of twist them together with the wire so that the wire is kind of in the center and then you kind of wind this 
You don't want to use your bobbin here. You just want to use your fingers. And this usually goes a lot better than it is now. Of course, and you just wind that forward. And when you get to the front, you just let these things come loose from the wire. Take one turn in front of the thorax, and then you just bring your wire underneath or on top back to the uh, back to the end of the thorax. And see now I've got that dark pheasant tail. Um, just where I want it for the wing case. And then you take one turn there, bring the wire back, and you fold over one final time. And you're done. So one material. One material and, uh, and some copper wire. Trim the head. Take a couple more turns for security and whip finish. You can whip finish with this wire. And you're done. And then you can actually break that. And you've got yourself a pheasant tail nymph um, tied all with copper wire. It's got, it's got some weight to it. Um, it looks pretty sloppy, but uh, it's, it's going to be effective. It's going to be effective. It's going to be a great nymph. And you can really crank them out quickly. All right. So now, any questions at this point? Now we're going to tie one a little more, a little more standard, traditional style. Any questions? No. Um, no. Oh wait. Here we go. <laughs> this is kind of silly, but Tim's asking, have you ever dismantled electronics to get at the copper wire? I have heard Sawyer use red varnished coil wire. But that might just be no, he did. He did. And he said it in his book. He said, yeah, you can find this wire anywhere. Just pull open some, some uh, electrical appliances. And yes, when I was a kid, I did it. <laughs> now I just buy spools of ultra wire. But yeah, when I was a kid, I would, I would take wire out of, out of, and he liked that. He liked the reddish kind of the reddish color copper wire. All right, so now we're gonna tie a um, gonna tie a little more conventional style. So same hook, and the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna I'm gonna add a little weight to the thorax to build up the thorax, uh, similar to the way Sawyer did it. Oop, wrong camera. No, that's the right camera. Uh, I'm just going to take a few turns of non-toxic wire up here. Just enough to add a little bit of weight. This is a great fly when you're, um, when you're sight fishing for uh, trout in shallow water. If you're lucky enough to be able to sight fish to nymphing trout in shallow water, because, um, this fly lands with very, very little splash. It's lightly weighted um, because it doesn't have any legs and it doesn't have a lot of material sticking out of it. It does sink fairly well, um, but it doesn't make a big splash when it enters the water. I can see on the camera I've got a little bit of wire sticking up there but that doesn't matter can't even see it when i'm looking when i'm actually tying it but i can see it in the camera lens good enough good enough now i'm going to scooch that back a little bit so i have room to finish the fly okay so i'm going to use orange thread 
to uh, add that touch of orange and to imitate the color that uh, Sawyer used. And I'm just gonna use my fingernail to hold that wire in place and then come back behind it and wind a little bit on there. I finally got that little goober to go where I wanted it to. And I, of course, I don't need to build up the thorax here. You don't want this thing to be really thick. And then I'm going to go all the way to the bend with the thread. And going to take uh, maybe five strands of pheasant tail. So I'm going to look for some nice stuff with a dark base so that, again, when I make the wing case, hopefully I'll get the dark stuff to show up. And I'm going to cut that off as close as I can. And then we're going to get these tails looking good. And I'm going to use, again, about three tight turns of thread to get those tails in there. Then I'm going to take a piece of copper wire. I have to go over and get another piece. And this is a little bit heavier diameter than um, this is the small as opposed to the alt, the extra small ultra wire. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab these pheasant tail fibers and pull them back gently, and then just lay that copper wire in there and bind it under. And I'm gonna stop right there where the thorax is going to be. Now I'm going to take my pheasant tail fibers and twist them a little bit so they stay together. And then make sure that I cover up that place where the thread started. Now twist them again to get them back together. Twisting them does help strengthen these fibers too, because they are delicate. Now when I get to the spot where my thorax is gonna be, I tie those off, but I don't cut them. I just leave them there. Now I'm going to take my uh, copper wire and I'll counter wind this. So I'm going to wind it back toward me. Um, what, um, what size wire are you using? This is uh, ultra wire size small oh. copper. And you, um, Brandon's asking, do you prefer wire or thread? I know you're, you're tying, you've tied both. But. Oh. Yeah, I like I like thread, and since I'm back winding this, I'm going to go a couple times around there um, because I'm I'm back winding it, and I want to I'm not I'm not exactly crossing that wire in the proper manner to secure it. So I just I wind it around the I wind it around the uh, the fly a couple times so it doesn't come loose. And I'm going to cut. I'm just going to cut that wire off a little bit big. Big wire cutters there. And then what I'm going to do is take those fibers that were hanging down, and I'm just going to tie back a little bit on them to get them so that, I don't, so that orange doesn't show through and I get them on top of the hook shank like so. Now you can see I've got that dark, that dark pheasant tail for the wing case, which is what I want. And then I'm going to cut another four or five fibers of pheasant tail 
and this doesn't matter as much. Um, I do have to tie in a separate piece of uh, a bunch of uh, pheasant tail for the thorax. I can't get away with one section of feather when I tie it this way. And I'm going to, I'm going to tie these in by the tip. So I'm just going to cut the ends off. Just like peacock curl, the ends are kind of flimsy. So I just cut the ends off those pheasant tail fibers. And then I tie these in right over the top. Wind forward to behind the eye. And then I'll just give these a little twist and wind them. Make sure you cover up that orange, not that it matters. Tie those off underneath. Trim them. And then pull your wing case over the top. Trim that. Wind a little bit of a head there. And we're finished. So again, fairly easy fly to tie. Um, once you learn how to handle pheasant tail, because it is a delicate material. And you can, if you want, put a little uh, glob of epoxy on the wing case. I do not. I like this fly as subtle as can be. I don't want to see much flash there. I don't want to see much bulk. And I find that... Uh, that fly, just the way it is, is going to be a killer. And you can tie them down in really small sizes. And uh, they work just fine. So do we have any... I'm sure we have some final questions. we have any final questions? No final questions? Julia? No questions yet. No questions yet? Okay. Yeah, it's a um, yeah, it's a it's a it's it's a wonderfully effective fly and and it's simple um, but there's there's a lot of brilliant design work that um, that went into this fly. And, um, you know, you have to admire someone who spent so much time on the water um, figuring out just exactly what combination of materials and what proportions to, to put into this fly. What hook do we use again? We use a uh, 1X long stand or 1 or 2X long standard nymph hook, JP. Um, uh, you know, what... Whatever nymph hook you have, standard nymph hook, down eye nymph hook um, is the best. Our hackle plier is useful for wrapping the pheasant tail. Joey, the hackle fibers can be useful. The problem I find with using hackle fibers is that the pheasant tail fibers seem to shorten up at a different rate as you wind them. And sometimes then you get kind of a, a loop that gets out of place in those fibers. So if you can get pheasant tail that's long enough, I would advise you to, to wind it with your fingers. I think you're um, I think you're going to be happier doing it that way. But sometimes, sometimes if you have really short pheasant tail fibers, you have to put it in, into hackle pliers. So, but um, try not to if you can because it'll just make it easier. Um, they don't. They again, they don't. They don't shorten up at 
at the same rate as you're winding them and you get little bumps and loops and stuff in your in your pheasant tail. Had a few problems twisting the copper and pheasant tail fiber. Is there a technique you use? No, Ed, you know, um, it's not easy. You have to, you have to kind of, you have to kind of get the, the fibers around the copper wire and then, and then twist them. And I have a, I have it come out, um, too sometimes. Um, so it, there's no easy way. I mean, I suppose you could make a loop with the copper wire and put them in a loop, but that would kind of defeat the purpose of the simplicity of this fly. Um, what other colors of PT nymph have you found effective? Wade, I've tried other colors. I've tried olive, which you think would be um, really effective, and it doesn't seem to be as effective. Um, maybe something about about the natural natural color. I have found the gray goose to be um, to be effective which is really just a pheasant tail tied with gray goose. Um, but you can use uh, secondary feathers from any gray, grayish colored, you know, um, duck feathers aren't long enough. Maybe a bigger duck, like a pintail secondary feather might be, might be big enough. Um, you know, any, any large gray wing feather uh, will work. Uh, you can tie this with turkey. You know, if you want a kind of a mottled tan color, you can take um, uh, mottled turkey quills. There are some patterns that use mottled turkey quills. Um, I have I have a pattern that um, I use that uses uh, feathers from a wood duck. But there there's only three or four feathers that have the right color on every wood duck wing, and they're really short and hard to wind. That's one place I have to use a hackle plier, so I don't. Um, I'm not going to even mention that one because it's a it's a real pain to tie, but it does have really nice n nice colors to it with using natural materials. Where is a fly tying room you're tying? Looks like you are at work. Yeah, I'm at work. <laughs> this is it. This is where I work. Um, I have a computer over there. I have bookshelves here. I have the cameras and studio there, and uh, lots of CDs to listen to. So. Um, yeah, I have three computers sitting here, but yeah, this is this is where I work. Can you do a tying session using only wild turkey materials? Nah, I don't think so. <laughs> but it would be the same. It'd be doing the same, Philip, as as we're doing here. Is just you know, figuring out. Figuring out what color you want to get in the fly and then and then using the feathers accordingly. Like when do you do fly tying using old school method and new school methods? Well, I don't, I'm not sure, Warren, what you mean by that. Um, fly tying is fly tying. I don't know what old school versus new school would be, you know. This is old school. Um, but it's still very much alive today and, and used very much. And, and people tie modern patterns that look like this and, and use pheasant tails. So I'm not sure about old school versus new school. It's, uh, it's just fly tying. It's all, it's all based on something that's done before. There's very, very few new, new, new things in fly tying. Um, Blaine chocolates game changer is probably one. And, um, and again, plain chocolate's gummy minnow, um, but there's not a, a I mean, the, the Pertagons are basic, are re really a, a new school fly, but they're based on the principles that, that Frank Sawyer developed for tying a skinny fly that would, would sink quickly. They're just using synthet mostly synthetic materials and putting a coat of epoxy on it, but um, it's very similar. Do you ever use dubbing for the thorax instead of PT? I don't, Brandon. Um, well, I do as an experiment. I'll put hairs here on there, but um, then it would be a different fly. And you use dubbing, and you're going to sacrifice some of that quick sink rate. Um, so it looks cool. And if you you know if you're going to if you're going to tie this in a bead head form, or you're going to add a little bit extra uh, wire underneath the fly, then yeah, you could use you could use dubbing. You can use anything. You use peacock curl. 
uh, there's lots and lots of different variations you could do. And I don't see any other. Oh, Anders says they use capercaillie in Sweden. I'm, I would like to get some capercaillie feathers and try those. I bet that would be interesting. Hmm. Always, always like to play with new materials. Um, does a bead work better than no bead for brooks in small streams? Asked Deborah. I don't know, Deborah. I think it depends on the day and, and the water. And, you know, um, I, I, I use both in small streams for brookies. And sometimes a bead works better. And sometimes I don't want it to sink so quickly. And I don't want as much flash. So I will use a, a standard pheasant tail. But it really depends. And, and you got to experiment. And you're never going to know until you get there what's going to work better. Right? Never going to know. Is the Stillwater Learning available in the UK? Yes, Tim, it's on the Orvis Learning Center, howtoflyfish.orvis.com. And it's, um, I, I assume it's available worldwide. It's on the, it's on the World Wide Web. <laughs> so yes, it will be available. <laughs> Josh, yes, uh, sorry you're late. I left out the legs because this pattern does not use legs. There are no legs in a pheasant tail nymph, in an English pheasant tail nymph for a good reason. Yeah, sink rate is faster without the legs. And you don't you don't really need them. The, the fish don't see the legs when this fly is drifting. The legs are tucked under the body and they're very insubstantial. So to put, to put legs on it would, uh, you know, the fish, even in, even in a slow moving spring creek, the fish still get a pretty quick look at a fly as it's drifting by. I mean, you know, you get underwater with a, with a GoPro or something, and have somebody throw a throw a nymph uh, by you and and see how fast it goes by. Even in slower water, it goes by pretty fast. It's even tough to keep the camera trained on. So um, yeah, I don't, I don't think you I don't think you need legs. Popovic's hollow flies are very innovative. Yes, they are, Ed. And I think I'm going to try to get Bob on a. Uh, podcast or something somebody suggested that today that might be a he would be a great guest to have on a podcast all right everyone well thank you so much for tuning in today i hope everybody stays happy and healthy um, take care of yourselves be careful um looks like we're many of us are going to be um housebound once again for the foreseeable future. Um, so um, we'll be doing lots of these tying sessions and maybe start doing, toward the, as we get into um, the winter time, we may start doing uh, two of them a week. So um, I know that a lot of you are looking for some entertainment and I hope I entertained you today. <laughs> uh, you certainly entertained me. So thank you. Nobody's teasing me these days. What's going on? Do I have to wait for Flagler for somebody to tease me? Um, our next tie is going to be next Monday at 3 p.m. Eastern time. And it is the um, uh, beadhead flash zonker, which is one of my favorite patterns. And I recently caught a bunch of fish on that pattern. So I've tied a lot of them. Um, it's a great fly. You can see it in the Orvis catalog. I'm going to tie a white one. Um, fairly simple, fairly straightforward, but a really, really good streamer. Very, very effective streamer when you when you want something that's wiggly and not too big. All right, everyone. Julia, do we have any announcements we need to make? The new the new Mirage LT Orange Reel is out, which is of the Mirage LT. Pretty sexy. Gorgeous. Yeah. Got a beautiful, brilliant, can I put it in the chat? We've got a beautiful, brilliant blue and and a, uh, what Sarah has called a pumpkin spice latte orange, but it's very <laughs> um, Let's see. Here we go. Yeah. Um, and we've just got a whole lot of awesome content coming up. We've got Moment of Chill starting today through Christmas. 
We've got great gift guides. Tom's going to have a gift guide coming up. And like he said, we're going to do some sessions in December that are all around, like, how to with flying, uh, fly tying, not just not just to the walkthrough. It'll be kind of like the basics, how to navigate. So just stay tuned to this channel. And uh, thanks for always for, for tuning in and being part of our community. It's, it's such a joy. Yeah, thank you, everyone. We really uh, we really enjoy tying with you. And I hope, uh, I hope you tied along. And if you didn't, um, Get to your vice and crank some of these out. You can never have too many pheasant tails in your fly box if you trout fish. You can never have too many pheasant tails. You'll always run out of them before you run out of anything else, I'll guarantee you. So um, tie lots of them. They're quick and easy. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.